mention of a new FAFSA launching this year, Lawrence Public Library wanted to partner with University of Kansas, Johnson County Community College, and USD 497 to offer this event where we could all take a deeper dive into the new FAFSA and just talk a little bit more about the college financial process. Um, we know FAFSA can often dictate like how much financial aid a student receives for their college education. And with the release of a new application, we figured there could be lots of questions and challenges for the first time as students fill out that new form. Um, and so for many families in the room, we also know the amount of financial aid your student receives can also dictate like where they go to college, um, if any, like university or child will attend. So we wanted to start with a presentation from two speakers who are going to walk us through the new FAFSA form, how to fill that out so you can submit that successfully and in a timely manner. And then after they're done walking us through the FAFSA, we're gonna have some area colleges, um, vocational schools and financial aid organizations tabling in the back of the room so participants can gather information after the presentation. Um, so now we would like to rep or to welcome our co-presenters for the evening, Liz Weiler and Danielle Sullivan. So Liz Weiler is Assistant Director of Financial Aid and Scholarships at the University of Kansas. And then Danielle Sullivan is the Financial Aid Advising Supervisor at Johnson County Community College. So please join me in welcoming the both of them. Thank you. I hear there's a game today. So thank you for being with us instead of rooting on the Jayhawks today. Um, well, my name is Danielle Sullivan. I work at Johnson County Community College, and I've been in financial aid for close to 20 years. I started with a lender with Department of Ed, worked at KU for 12 years, and at Johnson County for the past four years. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Liz. Hi, I'm Liz Weiler. I'm one of the assistant directors in financial aid and scholarships at KU. Um, I've been at KU for about six years. Um, I was a verification processor first at KU um, before getting more into the financial aid and scholarship experience and getting out and doing more things like this. Um, prior to that, I worked at an insurance educator, a, nation, a national insurance educator. So yeah, so I'm happy to be here. I'm glad that you're here too. I'll step over here. All right, so what's our agenda? We're going to talk about applying for financial aid, uh, different types of financial aid, understanding your financial aid offer, um, the important thing, how to pay for school, which is what this is about, and asking for help. And again, a lot of emphasis on the brand new FAFSA. All right, so what is the FAFSA and what does it do? The main thing about the FAFSA is it's free, free application for federal student aid. Um, we're here to help you with that today. We have lots of information, something to keep in mind. Um, there are some companies out there that will assist you with completing a FAFSA. They will also probably want to charge you something. So keep in mind, it's a free application. Um, it is going to determine uh, if you're eligible for need-based aid, um, federal aid, institutional aid, some scholarships, um, some things that it looks at is prior prior year tax financial information this year's FAFSA so we're talking for fall 24 spring 25 we'll look at tax information from 2022 um, as we know the FAFSA was recently available at the end of December normally it opens on October 1st I would think that next year it will open October 1st for 25 26 you will want to fill it out every year when we start talking about FSA IDs, um, setting up your login accounts, um, information like that. You want to keep track of that because you're going to use that every year and for the rest of your life. All right, so you might be familiar with the EFC that is now an SAI for this year's FAFSA. It is the Student Aid Index. And basically, it's the goal of the FAFSA, like what is that number? What information are you putting in there to get to that number? Um, it's based on student and parent information provided on the FAFSA, so things like income, assets, uh, number in the family. It measures um, you and your family's ability to pay for college. It's used by colleges to determine your financial need and your eligibility for different types of aid. And we'll go through all those different types today. It stays the same regardless of the college. So we'll talk about that. You'll do your FAFSA. Um, it, I think we could list 10 schools before, now you can list 20. So that same information, you have one FAFSA, 
and then that information goes out to the schools that you want it to go out to, what you've indicated on your FAFSA. Um, it stays, oh, it can be a negative number, so that's new this year. Um, it can be negative 1,500. And when we talk about financial need, we'll talk about costs, direct costs, indirect costs, but it's basically your cost of attendance minus your SAI. That's your financial need. And the goal is to get grants, scholarships, hopefully aid that you get that you don't have to pay back. But we'll talk about all of that. All right. So the first thing you're going to do is set up your studentaid.gov account, um, FSAID. If you are a parent and you had that for many years prior, that should be the same. Um, when you set up any online account, an app, you know, your banking portal from a website that you order stuff from, keep in mind we're going to talk about security. So keep your username, your password, all of that secure. We talk, uh, talk about like verification questions, security questions. Make sure you're keeping track of all that. Um, some things you might need to have prepared to do a FAFSA, W-2s, bank statements, social security numbers. Again, I'd mentioned the 2022 federal tax return and assets and investments. All right, so setting up the studentaid.gov account important reminders so everyone's going to have their own account you don't want to mix and match information that's going to cause issues later so students you should be setting up your own account you have that information forever the same with parents you're going to type your name exactly as it appears on your social security card i was just working with a student who added an extra s on their last name on their fafsa that's going to be a problem um, that's something that uh, we have to correct as a school that was an existing student so spaces, misspellings, all of that, just make sure that you're entering it exactly how it appears on your social security card. You'll want to link your, uh, link your email account, that's required, and your phone number, which is optional. Um, you can use your email or phone number to log into your account or retrieve a forgotten password. Um, you can use an email account or phone number you will readily have access to. You want to use that, I should say. Make sure it's something like if you're a senior in high school and you're using an email address connected with you being at that high school, you might not have access to that like three months, six months down the road. Each account must have a unique email address, phone number, and you'll need to verify each through the setup process. So you want to write down your username and password and you'll need it each year you sign the FAFSA. So that's important stuff. And some don'ts. Don't set up an account for anyone other than yourself. That's your personal, private information. Keep it secure. Uh, don't use a nickname. Use your name exactly how it appears on your social security card. Uh, don't share your password with anyone, not even a parent. It's your legally binding signature. That's how you sign the FAFSA. Um, don't use a school email. Might not have access to it once you graduate. Don't use your email or phone number to link to anyone else's account. Um, this causes issues later, and we've already seen some of those issues with phone numbers on different accounts, the same phone number. Uh, don't use your email, um, or don't forget to write down your username and password. You'll need it each year to sign your FAFSA. Again, we're gonna repeat a lot of this because it's super important. It just makes things easier as we move forward. Okay, so now we're actually going to go through what the screenshots are going to look like when you're in creating your accounts. And I do want to say this is the hardest part of the FAFSA. If you can get your accounts set up and they work, you're going to be fine. This is literally the hardest part of the FAFSA is getting this account set up. Okay, so this is what it's going to look like when you go in and you're going to create your account at studentaid.gov. And again, those websites are written down over there. Those are your two most important websites I want you to remember today, fafsa.gov and studentaid.gov. So you're going to go to studentaid.gov and click Create Account, and it's going to pull up these, these uh, screens up here. It goes through a verification process. So those of you who are going to want to file a FAFSA, you're going to need to set up your ID um, at least three business days before you try to start the FAFSA. This has been causing major, major issues. Um, Liz and I did a financial aid night at Lawrence High School um, earlier in January, and we had a lot of people who didn't come with their IDs set up and they couldn't do the FAFSA. It will prevent you from completing the FAFSA. 
So you as a student and whoever your contributors are, and we're gonna talk about contributors in a minute, usually a parent, all of you need to have your accounts created at least three days before you do the FAFSA. And it's gonna go through the Social Security Administration and that's how it's gonna verify you are who you say you are. So it matches your name to your date of birth to your SSN. And then once it's a successful match, your ID is verified and ready to go. So again, Liz had said, make sure you enter your name, date of birth, social security number, exactly how it appears. That's really crucial because if you make a mistake during this process, we can't fix it for you. You just have to kind of start over. And we have had students who've had to go in and delete their entire FAFSAs and start from scratch because there was a mismatch on the social security number when they entered it in. And then in the future, it doesn't work yet, but if you don't have a social security number, um, you used to not be able to set up an online account, but now you can, but that process is not yet working. But in a perfect world, if you didn't have a social, you could click that box, I don't have a social security number, and then you should be able to create an account. Um, the department hopefully should let us know when that's back up and running. You're gonna create your own username, uh, make it something you can remember, uh, I know that a lot of times if you have a common name, it's like Mike Smith 2183 underscore 50 because there are a lot of Mike Smiths out there. Um, when we get later on the email and phone number, I'm going to tell you why that's important with regard to username. And then you're going to enter your email address that you want to use to attach to your, your uh, account. And then you're going to confirm your password. So that's like the first step. Once you get to that, you're gonna, or get through that, you're gonna enter your mailing address, which is optional, but we encourage you to put a mailing address on there. Um, it is required if you don't have a social security number, so you will have to enter that. And then enter your mobile phone number, and if you don't have a US phone number, you can just skip that piece. And then it's gonna ask for language preferences. Right now, it's only available in English and Spanish, but if you do call the, the uh, FAFSA hotline, which is 1-800-4-FED-AID, I think they have up to 11 languages that they can translate into. And then the fun part, your challenge questions that you'll never remember, so write them down. You're gonna pick three challenge questions. It's gonna ask you things like, where did you meet your spouse? Uh, what's your mother's maiden name or your grandfather's middle name? Um, what's your favorite pet? What color was your first car? You can remember prom, when did you, what color was your outfit when you went to prom? So it's gonna ask those kinds of things. And you're gonna to have to remember them and I'll tell you why right now. So your ID is gonna go through a verification process where it's gonna make sure that everything is matching up correctly. Um, it's gonna make you verify your email address. It's gonna make you verify your phone number. So when you go in and create it, you're gonna get that little code that comes through on your email. You're gonna to have to type in the code to verify that that email address is correct. And you're gonna to have to do the same thing with your phone number. I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to enter a phone number even though it's optional because inevitably all of you in this room will forget your ID. Everybody forgets it, it's okay. And um, when you use it once a year, it's hard to remember. So that's why you wanna write it down. I put mine in my phone as a contact and it's not searchable. So, but if I scroll down to the Fs, it has my ID right there. And I put all this information in my phone so that I have it. So it's not on a piece of paper and I'm not at my house. So the email address and phone number are very important because if you forget your username, which you inevitably will, I have no idea what my username is, you can actually enter your email address and your phone number. And it will find your ID for you so that you don't really need to remember your username. But if you don't attach a phone number and let's say you forgot your email, then you're gonna have to answer your challenge questions. And if you get them wrong, it will lock you out for 30 minutes. So it's important to remember all of this stuff. There's also an Authenticator app you can download. I have one on my phone because it's easy to use. You can download an Authenticator app to type in a code to where you don't have to do the email or the phone. Okay, we're almost there. So this is the process for those without a social security number. You're gonna go through what we call a transunion question error based kind of uh, system where it's gonna ask questions that a credit bureau asks without running a credit check. And this is only for those without a social security number. And right now it's not working. <laughs> we don't know when it's gonna be working. So if you don't have a social security number, right now you can't do a, F a FAFSA online. You can do a paper FAFSA, but the online process is not gonna work for you right now, but it should theoretically at some point. But again, in a perfect world, you would get to this screen. It's gonna ask what it may be a past address. 
Um, where have you lived in the past? Does, do you know anyone who owns property? I love this question. It says, uh, which of the following people lives or owns property in Tahuna? It's not going to ask you that, but if you had somebody that you know who had property somewhere, it's going to ask those questions. And it's coming from TransUnion, which is a giant credit bureau. If um, it's not able to figure out who you are, that you're a real person, you'll have to go through a separate verification process where you'll have to call 1-800-4-FED-AID, fill out an affidavit form, and, and prove you are who you say you are. You're going to want to get this all done before you start the FAFSA. Now I'm going to turn it over to Liz to talk about contributors. All right, so new to the FAFSA form contributors. And something that has been confusing that I'll mention is when we're talking about contributors, we're talking about the person that is going to contribute information to the FAFSA. We're not necessarily talking about contributing money to go to college. So I'll say that right off the bat. It's a new term. A contributor is anyone required to provide information signature and consent and approval that's new too. consent and approval to have their federal tax information transferred directly from the irs into the fafsa form ultimately that shortens the fafsa makes it easier this go around information provided by contributors will be used to determine your eligibility for federal student aid and contributors who are identified under fafsa form um, they're not financially not necessarily financially responsible for your education expenses and i wanted to highlight that because it has been confusing all right consent and approval so you and any additional contributors identified on your FAFSA form must provide consent and approval. So even if one of your contributors, excuse me, doesn't have a social security number, didn't file taxes, um, file taxes outside of the US, consent and approval are still required. And if any of your contributors do not provide consent and approval to um, or refuse to provide them, you won't be eligible for federal student aid. All right, so if you, when you, your contributors provide consent and approval on the FAFSA form, you are agreeing to share your personally identifiable information provided on the FAFSA form with the IRS, have your federal tax information transferred directly into the FAFSA form, allow the US Department of Education to use your federal tax information to determine your eligibility for federal student aid, it allows the Department of Ed to share federal tax information with higher education agencies and all the schools that you've listed on your FAFSA form. And also allows Department of Ed to reuse your federal tax information on other FAFSA forms that you're invited to and choose to participate on. And then you can see kind of how that flow, what that's supposed to look like on the FAFSA what that should look like when you get to that spot. All right, um, something that is new, we've talked about the data retrieval tool, if you're familiar with the FAFSA, if you've done one before um, as a parent. And um, now it is the IRS Direct Data Exchange, or it, you might see it as FADDX or DDX. Um, the match is tied to your social security number, marital status, and tax filing status. At the moment, student or parent provides consent, answers the marital status and tax filing questions, a match with the IRS occurs, um, and uh, oh, I lost my place. It occurs on the back end, ideally. If there is a match, all of the tax return questions are skipped. So again, FAFSA simplification, trying to make this an easier and more streamlined process. Okay, so what is a contributor? Um, another thing that is sometimes hard and frustrating, um, a difficult challenge is marital status, figuring out, you know, who is my parent, who do I put on the FAFSA? So a contributor is you, the student, um, biological or adoptive parents, your spouse and or your parent's spouse. So what it isn't would be non-adoptive grandparents, foster parents, your fiance, or the other biological parent when they are not married to 
or don't live with the parent contributor on the FAFSA form. And again, there are little guidelines and things that'll take you through so you know how to answer those questions. And how are they identified? So whether contributors other than yourself are required on your FAFSA form, that's determined by dependency status, marital status, and tax filing status. So again, there is a flow to this, so it'll make more sense. You are a dependent student, unless um, it's age, so born before January 1st, 2001, veteran, active duty military, if you're married, um, children or you have children or other dependents, so dependents other than children, sometimes that's a grandparent, or another relative, maybe a younger brother or sister. Um, both parents are deceased. Um, you were in foster care after the age of 13. Uh, you were a dependent or ward of the court after age 13, you're an emancipated minor, you're in legal guardianship, or homelessness or at risk of being homeless. So if you are not answering yes, or if you cannot answer yes, I should say, to any of those questions, then you're going to need a parent on the FAFSA. So you're going to have parent information on your FAFSA. And a lot of students are self-supporting. And um, we wish that we could extend that independent student status to those students. But Department of Ed government still looks at these questions to determine if you're dependent or independent. All right. So reporting parent information. So a parent is defined, again, as biological or adoptive parent. And this will give you examples of how you work through the FAFSA. So parents are married, yes and no. It tells you when to provide information for both parents. Parents are, it's gonna take you through all the scenarios, we hope. Parents are not married, but live together. So are the parents married to each other? Do the parents live together? And then again, you can see there on the right, you have to provide information for both parents. Parents are not married. So parents do not live together. One parent provided more financial support or parent has not married. And then you can see the questions again on the right, how it takes you through to that information. You'll see the one in the middle, did one parent provide more financial support than the other parent over the past 12 months? And then at the bottom, if we're answering no, provide information for this parent only. So hopefully you can see the highlighted answers and how it takes you through that information. And we can help you with that. All right, so parents are not married. So parents do not live together. One parent provided more financial support. Parent has remarried. So again, parents married to each other, no. Did the parents live together, no. Did one parent provide more financial support than the other parent over the past 12 months? Yes. Has the parent you identified in the previous question remarried? Yes. So you're going to provide information for the parent and the step parent. Parents are not married. So parents do not live together. Parents provided equal support. Um, report the parent with the greater income or assets. If the parent has remarried, then you're also going to report the step parent information as well. So parents married to each other? No. Did parents live together? No. Uh, did one parent provide more financial support than the other parent over the past 12 months? No. Has the parent you identified in the previous question remarried? No. So provide information for the one parent only. And then we've talked about setting up accounts and providing consent. So we have the student is the applicant, the parent is a parent contributor, and the parent spouse may be. So that would be parent contributor. And you can see the flow there. Did parent and parent's partner or spouse file taxes jointly with each other in the base tax year 2022? And then no or yes. So you can see, um, yes, only one parent contributor will need account, the account to provide approval and consent. And no, we have parent will need account to provide approval and consent or parent's partner or spouse will need account to provide approval and consent. Again, that's giving you the full picture. But as you're wake, making your way through those questions, it gets a lot clearer. Uh, 
Okay, let's go back to parents on the FAFSA and contributors. I want to open it up for questions because this is all very, very new on who has to contribute and provide information. Does anyone have any? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Yes, correct. So the student is always the applicant. They will always have to provide consent and contribute. And then depending on the parent's marital status, if you're married and you filed a joint return, only one parent needs to consent. Both need to still contribute their information. Um, and then in cases of divorce or separation, it's the parent who provides the most um, financial support. If you go on, let's say you're divorced and say, well, my parents both provide equal amount of support, then you need to report the parent with the greater income and assets and the step parent if that parent has remarried. So the key takeaway I want people to remember is that in cases of where a, student, where a parent is married and they file a joint return, only one has to go in and consent. But if you file a married filing separately, both parents are going to have to go in and provide consent. So each parent's going to need um, a studentaid.gov account. That makes sense? You report that parent. Mm -hmm. Yep, the student will always pro provide the info for the parent who provides the greater amount of support. But sometimes parents say, oh, it's exactly 50-50. It's really not. Um, I would encourage you to really look at that. I've never seen a case of truly 50-50. But if the student is saying it is 50-50, then you report the parent with the greater income and assets. But in the case that one parent is really supporting the student more financially, you will report that parent. And then again, if that parent has remarried, you do have to report the step parent. Any other questions on that? So let's talk about invites. So once you get to this part in the FAFSA where you're, you're done providing your information student, you're gonna be able to invite your parent contributors to the FAFSA. So you're going to enter in their name, social security number, all of that information into this little invite and their email address and click send. And it will send an email to your parent where they can log in and use that link to contribute to your FAFSA. So some things I wanna point out, you do have to have your parent's social security number exactly correct. If the social doesn't match and your parent has already set up their account, it's not gonna work properly. So that social security number, you're gonna to need to go in and edit it. You can also put any email. So let's say your parent has set up their ID with a completely different email. The email doesn't matter. It does not have to match what the parent has set up on their account. Now, if your parent has not set up their account, they will not be able to provide consent until three days later. Because when the student goes in and does this and clicks send to my parent, that initiates that Social Security Administration check. So it's gonna run through SSA, match the name, date of birth, social that you've put on the invite, and hopefully it matches and it's gonna be in the system. So when the parent goes in and creates their account, again, if something doesn't match, it's gonna be kind of wonky. So parents, it's a good idea to have your account set up before you get to this piece. Any other questions? Yeah. I don't. What I would say is that if it's really wrong with SSA, for example, in your case, that really shouldn't be a middle name. They need to contact SSA and get that updated because it's going to continue to be a problem. But if they know that, that it, it's recording as their middle name, they could just do everything with just the one last name and it should match perfectly fine. 
Uh, but if it isn't right with SSA, you can actually update your information with, F with SSA. Uh, a question. All right, we're going to move to Kieran. So Kieran is excited to begin his first year of college next fall after he graduates from high school. His parents are divorced, and he currently lives with his father and stepmother, and he only stays with his mother occasionally. So it's Kieran's father who provides most of Kieran's financial support. And when filing their 2022 tax return, Kieran's father and stepmother filed jointly. So who do you think are going to be Kieran's contributors? Is Kieran a contributor? Yes, because he's the student. Should it be Kieran's mom or dad listed on the FAFSA? Dad, because dad provides most of the financial support. What about the stepmom? Should stepmom be listed or not? Yes, because they filed a joint return and he's remarried. So all three will have to contribute, but because they did um, a joint return, only the dad should have to actually go in and sign something. Good job. Liz, I'm gonna turn it over to you for, I can't report my parent. <laughs> All right, so what if I can't provide parent information on the FAFSA? All right, so this is what's called unusual circumstances. Um, there is such a thing as special circumstances and unusual circumstances. So some of these things um, may include, if you're a victim of human trafficking, uh, legally granted refugee or asylum status, uh, parental abandonment or estrangement, and a student um, or parent that's incarcerated. Um, situations that do not qualify as unusual circumstances include your parents just refuse to contribute to your education expenses, parents will not provide information on your FAFSA form, and parents do not claim you as a dependent for income tax purposes. So on the left, if any of those applied to you as a student, then that would be an unusual circumstance. So as that relates to the FAFSA, if you select yes, you've given the options, you'll see a screenshot, been given the options, you've read through that, read, please read through all the information. But if you select yes, then you can submit your FAFSA You'll submit it without parental information, and you'll be assigned a status of provisional independent student. So this is new. And then it says to, it'll direct you as a student to follow up with the school, and a financial aid administrator will make a determination regarding dependency. And what that process looks like is eventually when the schools receive your FAFSA information in the form of an ICER, then we would see that provisional student status, whether it's a report that we're generating, something like that. And then um, I definitely follow up your, with your school, but someone probably will follow up with you from the school. Um, and it might be a conversation that's documented um, or actual documentation in an appeal process. Yeah, we'll, we'll be doing that process as well weekly. All right, if you do not, as a student, have unusual circumstances, but the parent is still unwilling to provide information, um, that part is skipped. Um, you, uh, the student has the option to receive a direct unsubsidized loan only. And I'll give you an explanation. You actually have, to, actually have to acknowledge that on the FAFSA. So that means no Pell Grants, no subsidized loans. Um, if you submit the FAFSA without parental information in any of these circumstances, then again, you have that provisional independent student status and you follow up with your college. Again, we'll be following up with you. Homeless students. So who can make a homeless determination? So as a student, if um, this applies to you, you might already have some documentation from your school. So that could be from a director, a designee of an emergency or transitional shelter, um, an outreach program, a drop-in center, other programs serving those experiencing homelessness, your high school or district homeless liaison, McKinney-Vento representative, a director or designee of TRIO, 
or a GAROP program or a financial aid administrator. So again, these are conversations um, to have with financial aid administrators, financial aid counselors at different schools. And you'll see what the FAFSA looks like on the right. On the homeless um, thing real quick, at, J at JCCC, we have a homeless student liaison. Her name is Laura, and she works pretty uh, closely with our Student Basic Needs Center and all of our homeless students. So she provides wraparound services and connects them to different resources within the county. And she does uh, trainings with all of the Johnson County area, and I think some Shawnee folks as well, uh, does uh, annual training on FAFSA. Um, I think she's doing one coming up in a little bit. So. We're really kind of tapped into that at Johnson County Community College because we do have a high percentage of homeless students at our school. All right, let's talk the important things. That's why all the parents are sitting here today. Let's talk about the money and the financials. How does, how's this gonna look? So the cool thing is if you um, married filing jointly or you were single and the IRS is pulling your information over onto the FAFSA, you're only gonna see like four questions. It's going to skip all of the tax questions. So we have had parents who are very confused. They thought they did something wrong because it didn't ask about money, didn't ask what your AGI was, didn't ask tax paid, it didn't ask about anything. And that's because it's pulling it over directly from the IRS on the back end, so it's, you're not going to see it at all. So this is really what it's going to look like when um, the IRS does its job and pulls over all the information and you don't have to enter it which it's doing most of the time, but there will still be some of you who will have to enter all that information manually. So some of you may still need to have your tax return available and go line by line and enter that info manually. But it's gonna ask if you received any federal benefits like school lunch, um, TANF, WIC, all of those things. I think SSI is on here. And these are federal benefits that you have to be given based on your income, usually if you're low income. This question determines if you can leave your assets out on the FAFSA. There are a series of things you have to meet in order for your assets not to count on the FAFSA, and this is one of them. It's also going to ask for your tax filing status, and this is going to determine whether or not it can pull over the information from the IRS. If your tax filing status matches your tax, your marital status, then it's going to just pull the information over. Then it's going to ask about family size, and this is in direct relation to the Pell Grant, which I will cover later. All of you will leave here today knowing if you're going to qualify for Pell, which is pretty cool. We've never been able to do that before. So it's going to ask how many are in your family. It's going to pull this directly over from, I don't think they're called exemptions. What are they called now on the tax form? Yes, dependents. Okay. So on your tax form, it's going to have dependents, and it's going to pull over that number from your tax form. So if you've added a dependent since then, or let's say, you are divorced or separated and you each claim the student every other year, but really you're going to be the contributor, you'll have to update this section manually, which you can do. So it'll say, is this correct? And, and you'll say no, and you can update that family size to reflect accurately. And then it's going to ask about tax return information. Did you um, earn or receive that earned income credit, which I forget what schedule that's on. Then it's going to ask, did you go to college parent or student? And did you receive scholarships and grants that exceeded your books, tuition, and supplies, which very few of you probably did. This is a question people get confused on because they, like if it's a returning student, they wanna report the financial aid that they got. You will never report anything in this box unless you filed taxes on it because you had so many scholarships and grants. So I've never seen a student actually put anything in here. It can happen, um, but in general, this probably is not gonna, have a, a number in it, but it will be on your tax return and it will tell you what line to look at on your tax return. Then it's going to ask about child support received, assets and investment net worth, and business and farm net worth. So if you have any kind of assets, you're going to report the value of those assets. It gives you a nice long list. If you click that little question mark next to it, it will give you the whole list of what counts as an asset and what doesn't. Students, if you have a 529 account, you'll report that under the parent, not you. So the student's 529 gets reported under the parent. And then if you have a family farm or a business, you will report your business or farm net worth, and that will be the value minus any debt you have on that. And that's your net worth. Any questions on that? 
That's all the financials. Yeah, go ahead. Then you wouldn't report it. Mm -mm. This would have to be, usually it's in the, a parent's name, so it would be under the parent contributor on the FAFSA. Yep. And there used to be a question on the FAFSA that said, report any money gifts received on your behalf. It could go there, but they removed that question. So, yay for you. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna turn it back over to Liz to talk about what if things change between now and 2022, last year, two years yeah. ago. All right, so we're gonna talk about special circumstances. And a reminder with this information, I mentioned unusual circumstances, and we went through that in special circumstances. Any school, if you're perusing their financial aid uh, website or part of their website where it talks about financial aid, they should have this information listed so you can look at it. Um, special circumstances. So basically, the FAFSA this year is looking at your 2022 financial information, tax information. So what happened if those numbers are great, everything was rolling along smoothly in life, and then something happened in 2023? Maybe things are starting to happen already in 2024. We can actually look at what is going on. We'll talk about those examples and use different calculations to um, make updates or changes to the data, financial information on your FAFSA. The goal of that would be to lower that student aid index, which used to be an EFC. So you could be eligible for more need-based aid. So that would be the goal. Um, loss of income due to a job loss, reduction in wages. If there is a separation, divorce, a death of a parent or spouse. So income, two incomes down to one income. Medical or dental expenses, and that would be for um, you know, the entire family. So they include the student and the parents. Other dependents or parent enrolled in college or one-time payments. Um, a lot of uh, situations come up with uh, maybe an IRA distribution, maybe it was a rollover, not a distribution. So that can affect these things. Um, if this applies to you, and again, we can always point you in the right direction and explain the process, but you'll wanna contact your school's financial aid office to discuss the process. It's an appeal process, which just means you're gonna start a discussion, you're gonna tell us what happened, we're gonna talk about how that impacted you financially, and then see if we can update some of your information on the FAFSA. All right, so let's talk about types of financial aid. Yeah, yeah. What you would do, so the FAFSA has your 2022 tax information, uh, maybe 2023, high medical expenses, you lost your job, maybe you had you know a cut in hours, something like that. You'd wanna reach out to the school. You'll probably meet with someone in financial aid, financial aid counselor, um, and then you're gonna start looking at the impact. So, uh, you know, I had $15,000 in medical bills. Um, you know, I have, I already had some medical bills. Um, and I was on a payment plan for those, um, there are other things going on, then you'd want to start the conversation. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So again, this year, instead of um, looking at maybe special circumstances right now, um, or getting ready to receive a financial aid overview from your school, which we'll talk about. So you're looking at your SAI, what used to be the EFC, um, talking about you know your income and how it was impacted, things like that. We're looking at adjustments. We would be having those conversations very soon. So you will want to wait until I would say the school gets your financial aid information, FAFSA, and um, 
just I would start the conversation. Just say, I think that I'm going to qualify for special circumstances. Um, they can tell you what documents you want to get together because you're going to tell us what's going on. And when we start the process, usually write that in a written signed statement. And then you're going to have to give supporting documentation so we can actually see what that looks like. So definitely you could start the conversation. And then a little bit later in spring, be talking about the impacts. Yeah, it's a great question on the timing a little different this year. All right, so scholarships. Um, there are institution, institutional scholarships and outside scholarships, um, no standard application or criteria. Um, grants, F, there's FAFSA, Pell Grant, Daniel's gonna talk more about that. Um, loans, so all students qualify for loans no matter income level. And there's also a federal work study. All right, so scholarships, grants, uh, money that you get that you don't have to pay back. Um, there are all kinds of institutional scholarships, so different schools will have different things available. Sometimes those are there are deadlines associated with those. So you want to always keep checking your email and communicate with your school about deadlines or something that's program specific. Um, there's the state of Kansas scholarships. There are local and community scholarships. Um, you know, check maybe if you work somewhere that has um, you know, some kind of scholarship application that you could or apply for. Uh, if your parents are involved in different clubs, organizations, maybe it's something connected with a hobby, you wanna look everywhere. Now would be the time to start applying for all those scholarships. Um, some scholarships require a FAFSA because they're need-based, some do not. And we have our friend here, Michelle Ariano at the back from the Kansas Board of Regents. And did you know you can get a scholarship just for being a Kansas resident? Isn't that nice? Um, and you can get one for ethnic minority in the state of Kansas, and then Kansas Promise, which is a really cool new scholarship program. This one is only available at a community college or tech school. So sorry, KU, you don't get this one. We get it all to ourselves. And you have to be in a certain major. So at JCCC, we have a whole list of majors that qualify. Fortunately, English major is not one of them. Um, but if you want to do HVAC or plumbing or one of our other trades, um, all, oddly enough, kitchen and bathroom design, that's one of them. Um, law and public safety. So there are all these little categories, and we have them listed down there. Of course, health professions as well, like nursing, dental hygiene. We have a great dental hygiene program. So if you're interested in any of these uh, majors and you go to a community college or a technical school in Kansas, you can qualify to have 100% of your tuition paid. 100% of your tuition paid. So you don't have to pay anything out of pocket. Pays for your tuition and your books and supplies. So if you need some hardcore welding boots and a helmet, we'll pay for that with Kansas Promise. Um, it is a last dollar scholarship. So what that means is you do have to file a FAFSA. And let's say your Pell Grant is so giant that it covers all of your tuition, then Kansas Promise wouldn't cover. But it will cover everything that FAFSA, essentially grants, um, does not cover. So that is a pretty cool um, scholarship program. It is a service scholarship. So what that means is that you have to li live in the state of Kansas for two years and work in the state of Kansas after you finish your program. And I think you have to finish in like 36 months, essentially. Um, so you can't be hanging out at JCCC forever, working on your four-year plan. Um, that will be bad for Kansas Promise. But you do have to live and work in Kansas. Now, as of now, I shouldn't open my mouth. You can work anywhere. So you could go work at Starbucks if you got like a plumbing certificate. It doesn't matter where you work in the state of Kansas. You don't have to go into your field. You just have to work somewhere within the state of Kansas for two years after you finish your program. So it's a pretty good deal if you know you want to go into a certain trade or health profession at a community college in Kansas. And Michelle can answer more questions about that in the back. Yay. Okay, grants. So this is everyone's favorite. It's all the airplay and all the talk. Pell Grant. So this is the most common grant you've probably heard of. And the Pell Grant is for needy students and it's determined by the FAFSA. So you got to play uh, the FAFSA game in order to qualify. So you're going to file the FAFSA. It's going to be determined by the number in family and your adjusted gross income. I'm going to show you a bunch of fun tables in a second. And like I said earlier, you're going to be able to figure out if you qualify for the Pell Grant before you leave today. It's going to be based on the poverty guidelines established by the Department of Health and Human Services. 
And there is a limit to how much Pell Grant you can receive. So you can't be hanging out at KU on the eight year plan. Um, you might get cut off. You can only have Pell Grant for a certain amount of time because they want to get you to your first credential. And then another um, fun little grant is called SEOG. This is the long name, so I just shorten it, but it's Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, or SEOG. This is also determined by the Student Aid Index, and it does go to Pell students first, or technically the most needy students. Every school gets a different amount. So some schools can award up to $4,000. I've never heard of any school or worked at one that we can do that. At JCCC, we award $400. So our costs are pretty low. What do you offer at KU? I think it's a thousand, thousand, maybe a thousand. But this year will be different because we don't know what's going to happen this year. So every year, the funding for that grant program can be very different and fluctuate from year to year. So you might get one amount your first year and a, a different amount your second year, and that's that's not unusual. And then, yay again for being a Kansas resident. There's the Kansas Comprehensive Grant. Some schools don't participate like the community colleges, but all of our state schools do. And sometimes it's between 500, 1100. It just depends on how much K, uh, the Kansas Board of Regents gives to each school. And you have to do a FAFSA every single year to qualify for these. Every year you're gonna be doing a FAFSA. So Pell Grant, if you know your income and your family size, you can use these little charts here to determine if you qualify for a Pell Grant. So if you're an independent student, so that would be I don't have to put a parent on the FAFSA because I'm over the age of 24 or I was able to answer yes to all of those dependency questions like I'm a veteran or I'm married, I have children, you would be an independent student. So you would just find your uh, marital status. So are you a parent? Here's if you're a student but not a parent. Here's if the student is a parent but not a single parent, so you're married. And then the top one is if you're a, a single parent as a student. So this is for independent students. On the other side, this is for students who have to put a parent on the FAFSA. So the top one is, let's say you only put one parent because your parent's a single parent. You would find your family size on the left and find your adjusted gross income. And then this chart is if your parent is not a single parent. So you've got two parents that are married. So let's go over an example. So on the first chart, let's say it's just you and your mom. That was me, it was me and my mom against the world. So if she made less than $41,198, I would qualify for the maximum Pell Grant. If she made less than $59,508, I would get a little bit of a Pell Grant still. And then as the family size increases, the adjusted gross income increases as well, that threshold. So let's look at a family size of four on a student whose parents are married and they live together. So for a family of four, if your adjusted gross income is 48,563 or less, then you qualify for the maximum Pell Grant. If your parents' income together is 76,313, you would still qualify for some type of Pell Grant. So you can all do your calculations and know if you're gonna get a Pell Grant based on this information. Any questions on this? And this changes every year. It'll probably go up because it's based on the poverty guidelines. One last thing about Pell Grant students, this is very important for you, it is based on your credit hours of enrollment. So if you qualify for the maximum Pell Grant, you're not going to get all of that Pell Grant if you're not full-time, and your school defines full-time status. So at JCCC, full-time is 12 credit hours, so you'll get 100% of your Pell Grant if you're in 12, and then it reduces by a percentage for every credit hour. Notice there you can get some Pell Grant at one credit hour. I hear this all the time. I don't, I'm not full-time, so I can't get financial aid. Well, is that true according to this chart? No. So students can even get Pell Grant for one credit hour. They don't have to be full-time, they can be part-time. We have lots of part-time students. So our population, we have 70% of our students are part-time at JCCC, and you can still get a Pell Grant for part-time status. So that's really important to remember. All right, I'm gonna turn over to Liz to talk about our favorite piece of financial aid loans. Or did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. 
So if the Pell Grants, I can't do math, $1,000, you would get $10, I don't know what 1%, or 8%, the $80 of Pell Grant, you'd get $80 for a $1,000 Pell Grant. So it would apply to the bill. If there's no bill, you'd get that in pocket. Yeah, and then you had a question. Not true. Oh, sorry, yes. I was thinking of something else. I thought you meant, I, I heard first year students and not undergraduate, I apologize. So all undergraduates can qualify, but grad students don't get Pell Grants or any grants. No, because it's a federal, they don't qualify for federal grants, but you could qualify for institutional grants at the school. If there was a school that said that they give a certain grant to grad students, do you all do that at KU? So you're thinking of teach grant. That's completely different. A teach grant um, is kind of like Kansas Promise. You have to be in a teacher eligible program and you have to usually be admitted into the school depending on the school. And then you can get, I think it's the Pell Grant amount. It's really kind of weird. So you would talk to the school about that. And it is a service grant. So if you don't teach, you actually have to pay it back as a loan at like 8% interest. So it, it's a good idea to be in the program and not take that because you have to teach at a low income school as well or in a specific discipline even sometimes. But yes, so that's teach. All right, now we're gonna talk about everyone's favorite loans. Right. Loans, all right. So federal student loans. Um, the FAFSA is required for all federal student loans. And the main thing is we have um, subsidized loans which are need-based. You can see um, some interest rates there. Unsubsidized is not need-based. So that's kind of the two differences. Again, every school financial aid website under types of aid, understanding aid should have all this broken down for you. So there are different requirements. So for the first time you're taking out the loan, you're gonna do some entrance counseling, which is amazing. Um, I'm so glad that exists. A master promissory note. Um, you can see kind of the ranges for what like most first time freshmen receive. And then as with all the loan information, again, that loan entrance counseling, you'll get this information, but you'll talk about repayment. So it begins six months after you drop below half time status. In the middle, um, federal or federal parent loans. So it's for dependent students only unsubsidized. So it's not need based. There is a credit check required. There's a different repayment timeline, a separate application process. So it's the FAFSA plus an application, but you do that on studentaid.gov. And important with this one, it can't be switched into the student's name. So it is truly a parent loan in the parent's name. You can't transfer it to your student. If you had some kind of verbal or maybe even written agreement um, between you and your student, that would work out, but officially you can never transfer that loan. So that's your loan that you're paying back. And then there are private or alternative loans. So they have variable interest rates, variable repayment timelines, credit check require. Some of them may require a co-signer and you'll wanna meet with financial aid prior to pursuing this option. Um, some of them have what we call a satisfactory academic progress part. So that would be required. Um, if you didn't meet that, then you would lose the loan. You might have to repay something back. So those are all important conversations. Again, a lot of schools have some kind of um, page on their financial aid website where you can look at private or alternative loans and get some information like you'll have a link to their website but you'll see qualifications interest rates the different kinds variable interest rates all of that so that's important maybe do some research and then reach out to your financial aid office what need-based yeah did i say that oh sorry okay Does anyone know the difference between a subsidized and an unsubsidized loan yes Correct. Very awesome. You get a gold star today. Sweet. 
Are you in repayment on your loans? Are they paid off your loans? Or do you, did you have loans? Okay, okay. Become a teacher. <laughs> Possibly. There's some good loan forgiveness. So that's the correct answer. So subsidized, if you think, we know the words like subsidized housing, you know, that's when the government's gonna pay a little bit of that. So the interest accrues on the loans, but they kind of take it off quarterly on a subsidized loan. So you're not responsible for that interest. That can save you thousands of dollars. So if you have to take out a loan, take out a subsidized loan. Um, also, there's some really good forgiveness opportunities right now. I know if you get into certain payment plans, you only have to pay 10 years if you work in public service. So they're improving some on that. All right, another type of aid, federal work study. So again, there might be priority dates attached to this depending on the school. It's need-based. Um, this basically, you're working a job. Most of the time it's on campus. Sometimes there's something open in the community. So that's nice. Um, it's convenient for students. So understanding that you're a student first. So convenient locations, flexible hours on campus. Again, community service positions are sometimes available. You want to check with your school on how to receive federal work study and find those employment opportunities. Um, sometimes there's a career center link um, that, you know, when you're looking at information on school's website about federal work study, um, a job link, career center, jobs on campus, things like that. Um, income earned through the program does not count as income on next year's FAFSA. So again, if you are like, well, I'm going to work at this coffee shop or the store that I really, really like, it could be a problem. If you want to go home over the holidays, if you know you want to take time off to do something at spring break, that might not mean spring break at that job. Um, you know, you could, you might have to find someone to work for you. So again, this is nice because they understand that you are a student. All right, so how do you know how much financial aid you'll receive? So you'll receive a FAFSA submission summary. So it'll have an eligibility overview. So it'll outline estimates of aid and that student aid index. Um, it outlines the answers that you've given you and your contributors, what you've provided, and you can start a correction. We'll have a note on that here in a moment if any information is incorrect. Um, the school information will be on there so you can see what you've selected. And then your next steps, that would be any comments as well as required steps, such as making corrections, sending documentation to colleges. And you can see the example there on the right. And do you have anything to add to that as far as anything we've experienced so far, what we think is gonna happen? <laughs> yeah. So you get this FAFSA submission summary and they're telling you to reach out to the school Unfortunately, we are not going to start receiving FAFSAs. We were supposed to get them at the end of January. We are there. We don't have them. Um, not to bore you with details, but some things that have to happen on the school side when we get FAFSAs, we have to test our databases first. Testing usually takes two weeks because IT is involved. It's a whole thing. They don't like to be bothered. And they're like, we have to do this FAFSA thing. So we have weeks of testing our systems to make sure the data is imported correctly. So just because the department releases FAFSAs to schools in February does not mean a school is going to be ready to actually get information back out to you. I am guessing mid-February because they just announced two days ago they have to update all the underlying tables in the FAFSA. And of course, the feds need time to program that and do that. I, I really optimistically would say mid-February is when schools might actually start receiving information which means you might not get an offer until March. I don't know. <laughs> don't know. We don't know. We're just here. Yeah. So I wanted to mention that because, of course, this slide a FAFSA process between one to three days and sent to school. That is not currently happening. Um, so just keep in mind, everyone, we're all experiencing that. Um, the update, that latest update, is a good thing because they're gonna acknowledge and adjust for inflation. So that's a good thing, but it's gonna require some extra work, which probably means a delay. All right, so we will receive um, FAFSA information eventually and complete your financial aid file. So there is a financial aid offer timeline that you will receive from the school, private schools, public schools, community colleges, technical colleges. It's all gonna vary a little bit, but that you should kind of know what's coming. Um, 
you'll, you know, again, keep checking your email from the school. Email, mail, and then there's a portal. If anything else is required of you, let's say you get selected for something called verification, the school will notify you. And if you ever are in a situation where you don't really know how to handle that, what to do, just reach out to the school. Email, phone call, come and visit, schedule an appointment, Zoom appointment, something like that, because we're here to help you. All right, so questions. Um, does the college have a FAFSA filing priority date? On that note, KU has extended theirs from February 1st to the 15th, and I don't know if we'll have to do that again. Do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> we're late. Come to us. We're March 15th. We got a late start today. But although we're looking at that now, like March 15th, And then, of course, scholarships. Be looking for all those scholarships, working with your schools. Um, there's some uh, nice pamphlets and handouts and paperwork about scholarships. So start gathering those, applying for those. Um, again, keep checking your email. If it seems overwhelming, you're getting a ton of email about stuff, uh, skim it for priority deadlines. If you have to fill out a form, if there's a signature required on something. Um, how much of my aid is gift aid? So that would be free money. What is the actual cost after all that aid is applied to what your cost would be, your total? How much of my aid is renewable? And that would be like maybe like an incoming freshman scholarship. What does the renewal look like? What's the criteria? Um, what amount of loans can be offered? What's being offered? Um, balance between the student and parent, um, all of your loan details. Are there scholarships the school offers later once I'm accepted to a major? So maybe th something through a department um, might not happen until maybe you're a sophomore or a junior. Are there, um, are there private scholarships I can apply to my bill? And what will I have to pay out of pocket? So these are all questions you need to be thinking about. All right, we're in the last leg, strap in. We're almost there. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how do you know how financial aid pays. So a question we get all the time is like, does the school get the financial aid? Do I get the financial aid and then pay you? So I'm going to go over kind of how that whole process works. So direct costs are costs that are paid directly to the institution. And it can vary depending on where you go to school. But most schools are going to charge you tuition, maybe course fees, uh, maybe if you live on campus, there's on-campus housing and a meal plan, uh, those kinds of things. Um, some schools will charge books to your account, so you'll have books uh, for an actual direct cost, so it kind of would depend on the school. But mostly you can count on tuition and fees being on your bill, and if you live on campus, your on-campus housing and meals are going to be on your actual bill as a direct cost. And then indirect costs are things that you're going to have to pay out of pocket or reimburse yourself later. So these are things that are not billable by the institution. So the school's not gonna bill you for it. And that would be any books bought off campus. So if you go to a bookstore downtown, you buy books at the Raven, they're not gonna reimburse you for that. If you live off campus, which does include fraternities and sororities, those are normally considered off campus and you pay those directly. So they would not bill you for that or off campus meals. So you can't put all your McDonald's bills on your school account. They won't pay for that. Uh, transportation, Ubers, or any other kind of transportation, any bus passes that are not billed to you, and then, of course, personal and miscellaneous expenses. So those are all indirect costs that you will have to pay out of pocket. Things that can be both direct or indirect, I mentioned bookstore. So it depends on the school with these items in this category. Some schools will bill the books. You'll just charge them to your account. Some schools, you have to purchase the books, so it all depends on the school. Parking permit, that might be billable or you pay parking directly. At KU, they take your firstborn and maybe your second. <laughs> Even if you're an employee, they need that blood. And then <laughs> activity fees. So maybe, I think, do you still have the activity fees, like basketball, sports combo, yeah, all sports combo? Sports. So some schools might have activity fees or a sports pass something. Um, if they charge for campus bus, that could be on your account. I remember when KU actually charged for buses for a bus pass, and that was on your account. They don't do that anymore. And the way financial aid works is you're going to get equal disbursements each semester. If you're at a semester school, quarters, do it differently, you'd get a quarterly disbursement. But if you're going to a semester, which is fall, spring, summer, 
those are going to be equal disbursements and summer kind of doesn't count that's kind of a separate thing. So your financial aid for the year is going to be divided in two half will apply to your direct costs in the fall and half will apply to your direct costs in the spring. So it applies automatically without you doing anything except doing the FAFSA and getting your file complete. So as long as you've done everything you need to do, the money gets transferred to the school, the school applies it to your direct costs, and then if there's an overage, you get a refund. So bare minimum, I tell students, you need to have enough money to cover your direct costs. That's how much money you need. So how do you know how much to pay your school? So when your financial aid equals your direct costs, you pay zero, hopefully, because your financial aid is covering your direct costs. Let's say your financial aid is less than your direct costs. You would have a bill to pay, and you would have to pay something to the school. If your financial aid is more than your direct costs, cha-ching, you get a refund. That was me. It was fantastic. Get my little check. Budget it throughout the semester. Make Liz buy me coffee once in a while. Um, so that's when you get a little refund check, and you can use that refund to purchase your other incidentals throughout the year. So that's kind of how it works. Any questions on that piece? Okay, so let's talk about ask. Oh, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Who was that? Yes. Yes. Either can start the clock. So if you have never created your account before and you go on to try to do the FAFSA, it's going to prompt you to create that account. That will start the clock. Or if you go on and I'm going to do the account before I touch the FAFSA, that will start the clock. So the minute you put your name, your date of birth, your SSN into that system, that will start that clock. Yeah, you're welcome. Good question. All right, when should I reach out to my school? How much does it cost? Make sure you're looking at the school's website to figure out how much things cost. By law, we're all required to have a net price calculator on our websites. So you can put in some information about yourself and it will essentially estimate what you might have to pay out of pocket. And then if you want to know when the FAFSA priority date is or the scholarship deadline, those are going to be hopefully on the school's website. You'll need to figure that out. Types of aid available, the school's website should tell you that, but you can always make appointments with financial aid folks and we'll meet with you and go over things. Um, if you need to submit any documents, we have a lot of students who might have to submit um, citizenship documents or social security cards or driver's licenses to prove they're a real student and not some phantom online just trying to get free financial aid. So sometimes we have to have students come in and, and show ID in person. So as long as you get all of that done, you'll be okay. And then when is the financial aid offer going to be available? So what's the timeline? Right now, our timeline, timelines are way off, but normally in a normal year, we would have our timeline on our website to be like, we start doing things in this month, and then we do this, and then we do this, and we have a little calendar. So that's kind of thrown kind of off right now. So my final tips. So don't forget to apply for financial aid each year. Yes, you have to do it every single year, but it gets easier. Because like I said earlier, getting that account set up is literally the hardest thing. And once you get past that, it's smooth sailing. You can do it. And then the FAFSA is already out. It's working mostly. Um, <laughs> few hiccups. Uh, apply for scholarships throughout the year. If you're a senior in high school now, um, is a really good time to start looking for scholarships. If you're a junior right now, it's a good time to build your resume, to go out and look at what scholarships I might want to apply for, and maybe I need to join a club my senior year and start working towards that, or get real good at rowing or something cool. And then check with your college's financial aid office for those school-specific scholarships. We've got the CAV guarantee at JCCC. We've got Kansas Promise. I know KU has some. If you're like a music major like I was, you might get a scholarship. If you're in engineering, you might get a scholarship. What other ones? Engineering. Okay. Or an art student, something like that. Um, and then don't ignore emails. I know it's very tempting, but that's how we communicate with you. We don't come to your house and sing you a FAFSA song to get you motivated. If we did, we'd get things done, wouldn't we? Um, I wish we kind of did sometimes. But we do everything via email. We won't call you unless it's important. So um, answer your phones if we call you. It's very nice. It's also kind of shocking when I call students and they answer because I'm, I'm multitasking and they answer, I'm like, Wait, who is this? <laughs> you answered your phone, yay. Um, and then don't wait till orientation um, 
to figure out the cost of college. You don't want to be sitting there ready to commit and realize that you don't have enough money to actually attend. So make sure you get all your costs figured out before you go. And then that is it. Thanks for attending. This is Liz and I at the, the celebration for the championship. What year was that? Whatever year, I don't remember. But that's us downtown with 80,000 of our closest friends. <laughs> yes, right here. No, so it has nothing to do with who claims who on a tax return. It's who provides the most support. So forget about who claims the, the student. So whoever is supporting the student financially, it's that parent. So if you did a thing where maybe your ex-spouse is claiming the student this, the tax year of 2022, you can correct that number on the FAFSA because it's only going to pull over the dependents you listed. So if you didn't list the student that year, it wouldn't pull them over. And so you would just correct that number. Yes. That's the plan. October 1st. Yep, it's usually, it's been October 1st for years and years and years until it wasn't. But this is a good thing, it really is. I mean, the FAFSA used to be much more complicated. And if you can get through, like I said, the ID part, if the IRS matches your information, people were done in 10 or 15 minutes and were like, did we do something wrong? Did it go through? So it kind of is weird when you've been doing it so long, you think it's like there's a mistake because it's super fast. Now, if it doesn't link, it's going to take you a little longer to manually enter. And unfortunately, if you don't have a social security number, you can't really do anything right now. Any other questions? Let me get you and then you. If anyone has a magic eight ball, we could do that and replace bets. So they did everything that they were supposed to do with programming, we thought, to make that available at the release, and then it didn't work. So it was supposed to be released with the FAFSA, and it's just not working. And right now, I've got, we've got our little list of issues, and it's sad. It's like, there's no workaround at this time. I will get on my soapbox for this, but it's preventing a whole bunch of students from meeting priority deadlines. And now they're missing out on, on, on deadlines because they can't do a FAFSA. So there's a whole population of students that cannot do a FAFSA right now. It's very frustrating for people who are in this business to see that happen. Yeah, Kathy. Some of my best work is done in the grocery store at the roost today when we overheard a family talking about this and invited them. They did not come. Um, <laughs> I, when I'm not working, I get this. And I made the mistake of joining the FAFSA Facebook group because I'm like, I'm going to help people. And Department of Ed needs to improve their communication strategies. Everyone's so confused in the questions. I'm like, oh, man, and I want to go in and do that. Month. Great, now I'm working all the time because I'm answering all these questions on Facebook, too. Don't join that group. It's a lot of misinformation. Nobody knows what they're doing. Do not join the FAFSA Facebook group. Unless you can give answers, maybe you can join it. Be like, yeah. here's the difference between these loans, and here's where you look for it. <laughs> but yeah, I'm like, great, now I'm working all the time. I'm sitting on the couch doing it. I'm like, I got to not pay attention to this Facebook group. And we have our own for financial aid administrators. That one's fun. Because we're like you all, when is this going to happen? Like, when is this changing? When is this going to be out? Are we going to be able to help people without socials? That kind of thing. 
Any final questions about anything? Anything else you want to add? Okay. Well, thank you for coming today and missing out on the game. Yeah, there's more games coming. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I did